Well, a big thank you for inviting me. It's always good to be with reasonable people in these times of uh, strange uh, crisis. I don't know what, what's going on in the world, so thanks a lot. <laughs> um, I was asked to suggest some left-wing perspectives to justice, and as you heard, I'm a philosopher, so it will be a little bit abstract. I hope it's not too, too boring for you. Uh, I don't have a good answer, but I have some questions. A left-wing perspective informed by Marxism especially implies a view from political economy. That means um, you cannot start from norms, one of which is the idea of justice. It's a norm, right? It's uh, something ethical. But rather, you have to start from real power structures and dynamics, economic dynamics of the system. So instead of criticizing the system with some norms like justice, you need to criticize both the system and its norms because the norms are the norms of the system. And that's the problem with justice. Um, now the question arises, and that's the Frankfurt School question that you always get if you, ask, if you start like this. How do you criticize both of them, the totality of society, if you put yourself out of them, right? I mean, what, what kind of norm do you apply if, if you don't use the, the idea of justice? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not going to answer that today, because that's a philosophical question, right? And I would have answers to that, but not now. Um, but why do I bring it up then, if I don't have an answer? Um, because I wanted to stress that the Marxist insight um, that when you discuss justice from a progressive perspective, you cannot simply start with norms, right? That's, that's what I wanted to uh, start with. But this is what people do. If you ask a question about, tell us about justice, uh, then you, the first author that you hear is John Rawls, and what he does is start with norms, right? So from a Marxist perspective, there automatically is a big problem, a big issue with, uh, with John Rawls. Now somebody in Ljubljana, when I lectured there a couple of weeks ago, asked me, what is your issue with John Rawls? I mean, this guy's dead for 14 years now, and who cares what he said? And uh, my answer is, uh, yes, I would love not to deal with him, but he's been so influential, at least in the English-speaking world, that you cannot get around this. It's a big obstacle to, let's say, leftist discourse, because you have to go through this uh, figure for you, in a way. That's the German term, I don't know. That. You have to go through there, somehow. Um, just to give you one example, uh, on a recent conference on critical theory, there was Daniel Drutney, I don't know whether you know him, he, he did something on the young Marx, and his claim was, well, well basically, uh, Marx and Rawls, they, they have the same theory. At least the middle Rawls and the early Marx, or something like that. So uh, it's, it's, that's quite an influential uh, assumption, I think, and I think that's basically wrong. Um, I think that when you start that way, the leftist perspective is in danger. It's, it's, it's something maybe progressive, but it's no longer what it used to be, let's say. Um, now, what's the problem with Rawls? My basic uh, problem with Rawls is that, I mean, to cut it short, um, his good ambitions become twisted simply because he applies uh, neoclassical economics. That's one of the main uh, problems. He takes it for granted. It's a kind of uh, intellectual um, division of labor. And he says, OK, I'm a philosopher. I don't do economics, so I just take what's in, in the economic theory of my day and put it into my theory, and then I go on working. But the, the ideological assumptions are already in the economic theory. And that's why, from a Marxist, not Marxist perspective, I'm not claiming to be a Marxist in that school, but if you want to learn from Marxism, you have to uh, go into the economic details yourself. Now, uh, to remind you of what is uh, jo John Rawls' story all about, um, there's this first principle um, that very much has a lot to do with equality. So first principle of justice, everybody has to have the same right to all kinds of stuff, right? Equality. And then the second principle is, well, you know, in the real world, there'll always be inequality. So the real question is, to what extent and by what principles is this inequality justifiable? Um, and here comes the economic theory. Um, I think it's there, the justification, philosophical justification of social inequalities, um, that you have this neoclassical ideology and having its in, um, impact on philosophy. Um, now, what's, what's the principle? Uh, social inequalities are just in so far as they benefit everybody. So if I'm rich, that's no problem because you benefit from me being rich. Right? I can share maybe something or whatever the assumption is. Now, why is this ideology at its best? Because it sounds very social, 
to benefit from somebody else's uh, wealth. But also at the same time, it justifies the tremendous and also the growing inequalities that we have in neoliberal capitalism. You can justify them with rules. Um, two assumptions are doing that job. The first one is that the ones who are rich um, are rich because they are productive. And that, that's uh, what's leading me to, to the term productivity here. Um, because in neoclassical discourse, you cannot make a difference between productivity and income. If you earn a certain amount of money, well, that's your productivity, right? You made that money in the market, so you must be productive. There's no distinction between the two. So whatever you earn, it's always just because it's always going back to some kind of productivity. The second one is, the second assumption is, um, because these people are productive, the rich people are productive by definition, it's good for everybody that they do what they do. Because otherwise we wouldn't have, well, if I'm too quick, too fast, I tend to be a fast speaker, uh, you can slow me down. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's good for everybody that they do what they do, since it makes the cake bigger, right? If I'm productive, hence I'm rich, I increase the amount of wealth that could be distributed afterwards, right? So without me, the cake would be smaller. That's what you hear from economic students and teachers everywhere. And the third assumption is, these rich people will only do what they do, which is good for everybody, in, if they are compensated for their effort accordingly. They will not do it for an average wage, not even for 10 times as much as I earn. Uh, they have to earn what they want to earn because otherwise they won't do the job. And that would be bad for everybody because then we wouldn't have a bigger cake. Uh, and that's a quite convincing story, at least for economic students. It's my impression when I teach in business schools, which I do sometimes. Um, so social inequality is almost always just, according to this theory of justice, um, because it is deserved and because it benefits everyone. That's that's a problematic story I wanted to expose from the beginning. So what exactly is the mistake here? Um, I think I mentioned it already. It's an intellectual division of labor role simply takes this notion of productivity from neoclassical economics, not seeing this, that in this economic theory, we have um, a claim for political power. It's in there. That needs to be uh, decoded. So critical theory needs to go into that economic theory and show how power structures are in the theory itself. Um, the demands of a certain class are expressed and petrified in this seemingly neutral frame. So in a way, what I'm doing here is class struggle in theory. Wow, that's, that's a big reference to make. I'm sorry, but um, can't afford it. Um, so in this seemingly neutral frame, um, that also invisibilizes the power structures, right? They are in there, but you cannot detect it because it comes along as, it's a neutral story. I'm not I'm not partial, I'm universal. And that's the, that's the trick. So hence, if we want to do something else, we have to have a closer look at political economy, especially the notion of productivity within political economy. Um, and what I'm doing now is something similar to what I did in Ljubljana. I hope nobody was present there because there might be a little repetition, but uh, I'm trying to be quick here anyway. Um, what I have to tell you, Two is that I had um, the opportunity to teach a class on the history of political economy at the business school, which is uncommon because they usually don't have this history of economic thought. And I'm a philosopher, so it's, it's very strange to have a philosopher lecture on the history of economic thought, but I did. And when I reread all these texts, I was struck how much not only power structures are in there, but also violence, physical violence, references to physical political actions that are so cruel, but they are described in these theories. And I didn't remember that from my early days when I read it the first time, and it was so visible in these texts. So that's why I had the term violence uh, in my title, right? because I think it's, it's striking, it struck me really. So let's start with the term productivity. Um, in fact, there are two different meanings of productivity, um, at least two different. Let me start with a very simple example, the image of an apple tree. Is the tree productive? I think, yes, it is productive. Why? Because it produces apples. <laughs> and you know that culture and agriculture comes from this very practice of raising trees. 
the atoms have not been there before. They only exist because the tree, tree transforms some transformation of matter. In Marx, you find that that word. Um, it transforms some water and soil into fruit. And if you have a look at this tree, it has a certain image of continuity, stability, it is natural. That's why, for example, families use this big image of the tree for their own history. It's hard, it, it looks very con stable, continuous. Um, so you see that, um, but at the same time, sorry, footnote, nothing new is happening. It's always the same tree, it's always the same apples. So it's not necessarily growth included. It's rather static. Even though I'm not so sure about that because forests, for example, extract what you know. So maybe it's not really clear cut. But anyway, let's assume it's stable. The first notion of productivity, so in this case, let's, let's take the apple tree, rather means reproduction. The apples are reproduced every year, so we have 10 apples this year, 10 apples next year, and so on. It's steady, reliable, and sounds natural. Now, for some even female, reproduction uh, sounds like household, right? Cooking and washing and all of that, that's rep reproductive labor. Of course, that's a false assumption, but uh, it's, it's there. That's why Hannah Arendt, for example, neglected the concept of labor because for her it was only reproduction, only something that's always there and it's necessary but it's not really important. Um, the second meaning, there's another meaning of productivity which is different. Yeah? And it's important to see the difference. Um, the second meaning of productivity is related not to nature but to reason and technology, changing stuff, increasing something. Um, Maybe this is why it has a male ring to it, right? It's rational, something like that. In any case, this other term of productivity is called productive because it increases the amount of goods available. It's not 10 apples every year, but if you're productive, you need to have more than 10 apples, right? And real productivity means that you have 20 apples the next year. Then you have some kind of uh, productivity, which is really uh, linked to growth. And we will see the implications of this um, in a minute. Oh, yes, um, now, if, if we start with these basic distinctions um, and go back into the history of political economy, um, I think we can see something from the very start that it starts with wrong assumptions. If you have like the regular story of historic, uh, history of economic thinking, um, the assumption usually is that at the beginning there's scarcity. Right? There's not enough for everybody, and that's why we need productivity growth and all of that, because only then, if the cake grows, we can have enough for everybody. Now, if you go, that's why I bring up this year. <laughs> if you have uh, like the, the alternative story to this, um, you see that there's some, some other story. Um, well, let's start, let's start with the, with the standard story. One of the key assumptions that I think is deeply wrong is the assumption that economics is about scarcity. And once you assume that everything is scarce, that we never have enough, the one who's the most productive is always the good guy because it provides ever more goods and services to everybody. Hence, increasing productivity and growth is a good thing per se, by definition, and it needs to be fostered at all costs. Look, increasing productivity is more important than everything else um, to politics. Even if it increases in inequality, waste, and pollution, that's the usual picture that you get in economics classes because you start from the notion of scarcity as the natural thing. Now if you have a look at the history of economic thought, you do not find this scarcity, but rather, this is why I bring up this here, um, you do not find the notion of scarcity and hence not the notion of productivity and growth for some time. Instead you find something like complacency, which is being happy with what you have. And this is of course a joke, uh, the Flintstones, um, they live in the Stone Age, and they seem quite happy and content. Uh, but there are other people who claim, uh, like in real theory, that uh, in all the stages of society, there actually was not scarcity, but some, some kind of affluence, which is means, uh, which means uh, well. Uh, this is the guy that I'm mentioning, Stone Age Economics, Marshall Salins. He has some interesting numbers, if you go into this uh, book a little bit. Um, the first thing that you can see is, and I wanted to show you some graphs, but I think not able to do it technically. He has some graphs where you can show uh, the labor time of these people uh, in the Stone Ages, where he shows that the average labor time per day, and labor is defined as caring for uh, the necessities, 
necessities, right? food, shelter, and all of that, three hours to five hours every day on average. And that means they could have expanded their productivity if they had worked more, because three hours is not very much, right? So it would, would have been possible for them to collect more fish, to collect more fruits or whatever, and, and then store it, but they didn't. And he deducts from that, Marshall Sellins deducts from that, that they must have been quite happy, because they didn't increase. They didn't increase the level of productivity because they were happy. And another, another way to measure that is to, to have a look at time consumption studies. What did they do with that time? Uh, and one of these other graphs, I'm not able to find it so quickly, but it shows that the rest of the time that they didn't work, a lot of it they slept, even during the day. <laughs> and now the question students always ask is, how does he know? Does he have a time machine? Or how do you find out what people in the Stone Age did? I mean, he did studies with some communities in the 70s, I think, or 60s, that were quite like people thought culture in the Stone Age must have been. So it's, it's uh, an analogy he draws, but nevertheless an interesting analogy. And of course, when you bring that up um, with Marxist uh, connotations, it's of, of course you can see that uh, early communism, I mean Engels and, and these people, even in the, in the Communist Manifest, you find that, that in the early days we had communism. That doesn't mean that we had communism like we had communism here, but rather we had the assumption that everything belongs to everybody, right? And with, with this notion of everything belongs to everybody comes equality. That's another thing that's important here that equality um, is something that is not depending on growth and not depending on having a rich elite that provides the cake, but you can, you can have equality on very um, low level. Let's say. Now, uh, there are some other pictures that I wanted to show you, but I think I'm going to skip it, because the next thing that you have to explain to students is when in the beginning you have complacency and a notion of affluence, why do economists start with scarcity? I mean, that's a wrong assumption, obviously. How do you get there? Um, these are other pictures. Um, it has something to do with this artificial scarcity. I don't know whether somebody knows this poem from Fischer und seiner Frau. Um, here you have this, this typical picture where you, say, where you have everything, right? The, the wife, of course, it's the wife. Uh, it's the bad, the bad girl in this, in this story. I don't know whether you know it. Do you know it? Um, it's about a fisher who finds a fish, and the fish promises him, promises him to give him something if he lets him free. And he, he keeps on going to the fish, asking for more and more and more, because his wife is never satisfied. And this being never satisfied, I think, is the real notion of scarcity in economics. It's not about a real lack, it's about a comparative lack of that there would be, could be more. And another, uh, keeping up with the Joneses, that's the usual way to explain it, right? Here, you have this house on the right. Of course, it's, it's big enough, but if the neighbors have a bigger house, then there's scarcity. But what is scarcity? Scarcity only is the difference between the good enough house and the better house, right? So that's, if you want, uh, you could claim that this is an ideological construction that you need in order to have capitalism go, right? Okay. Now, this is not history of economics as a science, but this is rather history of economics from a historical perspective. Um, the first thing that I think is interesting if you go into the history of economics as a discipline is Aristotle. But even in Aristotle, and these are my Aristotle pictures, flourishing, of course, um, I think it's noteworthy that neither in Aristotle is there growth. We don't have growth in the uh, Stone Age. We don't have growth in Aristotle. Um, if there's an idea of productivity, it is in the steady reproductive sense. Uh, but this kind of work is not done by the, by the good guys, but rather by, well, by women, by slaves, by outsiders. Right? Uh, what you should do, from an, even from an economic perspective, which is about the good life, is how to use the resources wisely and distribute them in a way that you get the best out of it, which is not spend everything on consumption, but also invest something on education, for example. Um, yeah, but Aristotle, that's a little bit far-fetched now. Um, the first time that the notion of growth comes in, wow, it's getting crowded. Is mercantilism. Um, however, in theory, 
that's the, the story that you had in the 16th century. Uh, oh. So the first time that you have a notion of growth comes in uh, is in mercantilism. Theoretically, however, this is a growth of income without productivity growth, which is interesting. Again, confusing for uh, students of economics. The, the mercantilistic uh, uh, baseline is quite simple. Grab as much as you can. Take it. Take it from other people. Economics, in this sense, is the art of taking or the art of robbery, right? From a mercantilist uh, perspective. And uh, you can see that there's something wrong with it. Robbery is something that is not really moral. Um, if you see how this kind of economics is pictured in the, in the popular art, you can see that this is bad. I don't know whether you recognize who's in this goal. Uh, does anybody recognize it from uh, Lord of the Rings? That's Smog. Uh, <laughs> that's the dragon, right? He's hiding under the gold, so the gold somehow is dangerous. Um, here are the eyes of the dragon. Here's another one. He's the keeper of the coin. Of course, this guy is also very bad. And then here's another guy that's the sheriff of, sheriff of Nottingham. He's a tax collector. He's also bad, right? But they are they stand for the ethics or the economic theory of mercantilism because mercantilism is all about taking from other people, in a way. I mean, that's cut a, cut a long story short. Um, how is economics possible without growth? I mean, how, what's the idea here? Um, it's about trade, not production, hence no productivity, but rather trade. Terms of trade become important. If you buy cheap and sell dear, you will make a profit, of course. It's a calculation of numbers, very easy. But in order to do that on a regular basis, not by chance, but on a regular basis, you need to construct oppressive structures that institutionalize the unequal exchange, as it was later called, because you want to rely on it on a regular basis. So that, need, that means you need to build institutions that guarantee that you can have this unequal exchange always. And if you have a look at how that works, in mercantilism, as we call this economic doctrine, which can be called a theoretical backbone of colonialism. How does it work? In order to make a profit from trade with the colonies, the colonies were not allowed to sell to other countries, for example. They had to sell to the mother country. They were not allowed uh, to industrialize, so they had to sell cheap goods. Um, and all of, all of these uh, repressive, let's say, repressive political structures. Um, and it's important to see now that the next step in the history of economic thought, Adam Smith, um, was so important because he was against this political oppression. And there was a moment of freedom in this because he said these political structures are un structures of unfreedom, pretty clearly. So you can say that the classical economics, is starting with not only Adam Smith, but mainly Adam Smith, was a school of freedom, not only free trade, but also freedom as a mentality, liberalism, liberalism if you want, economics of liberty. Of course, there are dark sides to, to this new classical approach too, but if you compare it to what's been there before, that is a true claim, I would say. Now, I'm coming to the classical approach, which was hegemonic for centuries, but I want to start with John Locke, not with Adam Smith, but rather Locke. Um, as everyone knows, he more or less invented the labor theory of value, which also is a theory of property, and also it's a theory of justice. And on this space, um, he builds this contractarian superstructure, a republic, that's key function is to preserve the property rights and protect the productive classes. Now, if you go into, the, into detail uh, with John Locke, in his famous Second Treatise on Government from 1689, you can see how the new economics of liberty become also become. It, it, it is liberty, liberalism, but at the same time, it becomes a legitimation of political violence, again, of expulsion and dispossession in the heart of the economic theory, which is a striking fact. And funny enough, it's exactly the, the semantics of productivity that Locke does. It. So it's not something that comes later, but it comes in the center of the assumptions of economics. Um, Locke, too, just supposes two senses of productivity, and these are the senses that I started with, like the natural one and the technical one. The one is the natural uh, sense of productivity. Think of the apples on the tree or the fish in the water, fishing and hunting, you know, uh, the connotation. Marx later credited nature to be the author of this primary productivity, but even according to Locke, it is work to hunt, to fish, or to gather fruits. It's, it's not nature itself, but it's also work, so that means if you do that work, if you go hunting, fishing, and stuff, that doesn't only mean uh, that people own what they hunt, 
it also means that they're on the ground where they hunt because they have put their label in it. Right? So there's a claim to the ground as soon as you start working. If you pick up, a, if you pick up an apple, already it's yours. The land and the apple. Um, however, this is only one notion of productivity, and unfortunately there are other people with another notion or practice of productivity. And these other people are productive in the other sense, and they unfortunately increase productivity. So basically the idea is they can use more of the land, they can use the land to a better purpose. And it's only here that the uh, labor theory of value does its real job. So the other one is just preparing the ground. The labor theory of value in the second sense is an instrument of expulsion, or at least the legitimation of expulsion. If you count uh, the number of appearances of the word um, enclosure, I think it's at least, I, I would wild guess about 30 times, you find it in this. For in the last instance, um, it's only the second sort of people that has a right to property in law. In the last instance, they are, they have the claim to property. And the reason for this is that the first culture of production, as I will call it, does not rely on the notion of private property. The land that bears the fruit belongs to everybody. You could say that's a notion of justice already. However, the other culture of productivity does rely on the concept of privatization, which usually means robbing, taking it away from them. Now, robbing, again, seems to be bad. Now, what does the labor theory of value do here? It does some kind of theoretical magic and shifts um, this accusation of robbing. Who's robbing from whom? You can tell a different story if you use this Lockean theory. In the end, the people who live in the sustainable culture of production are the ones who really steal. So you can take from them because they are the robbers, right? The hunters and gatherers, they are the robbers. How, how can you make that? Uh, Credible claim. Well, first of all, Locke says that in the value of the products that are produced by private property owners, the new ones, the new guys, 90% come from labor, or even 99% or 99.9%, whatever. It's not coming from the land, it's coming from the labor. That means that the wealth of these people that they produce on the land that they took is not taken from somebody else. I take your land, but the products that I take are not taken from you because you didn't you didn't produce them. I produced them. So if I produce the new products, I don't take them from them, uh, from you, because you, haven't, you didn't have them. Um, so that means that the wealth that these people produce um, is not taken from the former owners, be it the local peasants in England, or be it Native Americans, um, simply because what they own was not there before. It's a new product, it's not taken from the same tree. So this argument, of course, is not fully convincing because it only con covers 99% and there's still 1% that is taken, right? So there still is some kind of robbery involved or uh, expulsion involved. Um, that's why Thomas Paine, by example, which I think is very interesting in terms of uh, theory of justice, said that we have to reclaim these 1% or 10%, in fact, and Thomas Paine is 10%, uh, because you never paid us back these 10% that you took from us now it's time to reclaim it, and that's uh, in the theory. If you go into the theory of the basic income, that's one of the key sources how to uh, justify the claim for a basic income. It's from this former common property of land, which was taken away and never paid back. Now it's time to pay back, and since it's 10 percent, it should be 10 percent now. That's uh, Thomas Paine, 1797, in the text called Agrarian Socialism. I can recommend that uh, if you have spare time. <laughs> it's worth reading. So in a nutshell, the argument is that the class that's more productive than the other class has a right to redistribute existing property. Property titles are therefore not stable if you own something but don't use it productively, or at least not as productive as I am. That allows me to take it away from you because I'm more productive. Right? And now I still have to say how they change this notion of robbery. Uh, it's a mathematical, mathematical game. If I can produce 1,000 units of value on this ground, and you only 100, that means that if you use it, there will be 900 less for the community to consume, right? So that means if I do it, there's 1,000. If you do it, there's 100. That means if, if I leave the ground to you, there will be 900 less, and that's, that's why you're robbing the community of 900 units value, right? I don't, because I provide it for everybody. You do, because you, okay, it, is that clear? It's pretty much common sense logic. And I wanted to show you something, um, because in Marx, and if you talk to Marxists, they say that, okay, that's, 
that's primitive accumulation, what, what Locke is talking about here. That's long gone. It might have been unjust, but we don't have that any longer. But if you have a look at David, David Harvey and the theory of land grabbing and all of these kind of things, you can see that we pretty much have it every day on a, on, a, on a daily basis. I wanted to show you a trailer of a movie, but I think I don't have the time. Um, oh, this is mercantilism again, why having money is bad. <laughs> if it's the sole motive, it's bad. Um, where's the trailer? Here's the trailer. Uh, the movie is called La Buena Vida. It's a, it's a German movie, but it's about Latin America, and it shows uh, how land grabbing works in practice. So, the concept of productivity, that's my bottom line here, legitimizes uh, thesis and unequal power structures, and that's why the concept itself has become so contested and remains to be contested. Um, like in the vulgar material textbook, if you now go into the history of economics after John Locke, um, you can always see new classes popping up with new claims to power who frame their theory as the theory of productivity, which always shows that their notion of economics is the most productive. Hence, they have the greatest uh, claim or the greatest justification, to come back to justice, to the greatest share of the social product and also <coughs> to a more influence in political terms. So that means, uh, and the latest example for this is the creative class. For example. We have government reports uh, that try to show that uh, actually the most productive class in the moment is the creative class. So we, we should have uh, the creative class. What did I say? Creative. Creativity, okay. yeah. Creative. Artists and philosophers maybe, this guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah it's us. Uh, so there must be something wrong with that claim. Anyway. So um, I just wanted to give you a picture of what kind of classes and what kind of theories are there. Uh, it's really interesting. Starting with the merchants in mercantilism who de demanded the most influence in the state, which also includes favorable tax regimes, of course, and the provision of infrastructure tailored to their interests. Uh, so all of that should go to merchants because they produced or provided the wealth of the nation. We saw that in Locke, it's some kind of industrial elite who, who do the same thing. Only now it's, it's them. Um, other classes would be landowners, of course, uh, Thomas Martens. And you could spell out the story on and on. The next one would be um, maybe more interesting, uh, Keynesianism and uh, neoliberalism. You can ask the same question. What, what class is behind Keynesianism and what class is behind neoliberalism? And I'm going to come to <coughs> this in a moment. How much time do we have? Let's see. Now I'm going to skip something. I think I have to skip something because otherwise it's too long. Um, let me jump to Kisney. Uh, the next step would be physiocracy. So I'm building up uh, the history of economic um, in a way that's interesting for today's discussion about justice. Um, let's have a look at this physiocracy for a little while. Um, Although we associated the sustainable, non-growth understanding of production with nature, in my early example, it's exactly nature of physics that stands for the other growth-related understanding of productivity here, in, in the next, uh, you know, maybe this um, tableau economique. Um, in society as a whole, and you know this story, there are different, I think I'm going to cut that short too, uh, there are different classes, the nobility owns a lot, but spends it all without reproducing all of it. So that there is a rich class, and this is interesting if you contrast it to neoliberal economics or neoclassical economics. He counts it as a loss because these people don't reproduce it. They, they earn a lot of money, but they spend it on bullshit, basically, I mean, uh, luxury consumption. And in economic calculating, that counts not as something that is a gain or something that is productive. It's pure waste. And that's why they're called. Um, they're not the productive classes, they're the unproductive classes. Then there are the... Hangers on. What? Hangers on. Yeah. <laughs> then there are the uh, neutral classes, that are the... Um, where are the where am I? Neutral classes are the ones who do uh, handicraft labor. And then there are the real productive classes, because if you add 
handicraft labor, and then these waste guys, you still have the waste because the neutral classes don't add anything. So you need a productive class that covers the losses, basically. And this productive class is, of course, uh, land labor in that case. Uh, for Kisne, these are um, the productive class because they add up something. Marx would say um, what this third class produces is not really products. I mean, and that's just the, uh, uh, it's a trap of thinking because it's called physiocracy. It sounds something, it sounds physical. But what it really means is surplus value. It's more output than input. So there's an increase, and it's only in this kind of labor. And that's what productivity is all about. And in other words, Marx and Smith and Ricardo took this term of productivity from Kisne. Because the assumption was they're not only producing things, they're producing more things than is going into it. And that's what the, the notion of productivity is all about. It's about surplus. So the term of productivity becomes more complicated here because we cannot tell the productivity of an activity by the individual labor output ratio, as neoclassical economics do. Let's say if you earn one million euro by playing tennis for an hour, uh, the physiocrat has now has to look at the total system and see what impact this one hour of playing tennis has. And then you can ask the question whether it's justified that you get this one million dollar or not. Um, for neoclassical economics, if you earn it, you earn it, full stop. You're productive. Here you have to ask the question, and we have first have to know the effect of this activity on the economy as a whole. Um, so it's not clear. Does the match produce anything? Um, if not, you can technically call it uh, consumption. You spend part of your income on a ticket that allows you to watch the game, but after the game, the money is buried. And that's why it's called luxury consumption, or uh, in the uh, calculation of the social product, it's called consumption, right? It's, it's going. It's, it's not productive, it's consumption. And that's why, for example, uh, the town of Hamburg in Germany voted against uh, Olymp the Olympic Games, right? They, they wanted to apply, but then they had a vote, and they said, no, we don't want to do it because it costs a lot. Even though there's a lot of money flowing around, in the end it will be a cost. And that goes back to a different notion of, notion of productivity, I think, which is um, I skip something else. So uh, the real catch of the argument, I think, is growth-oriented here. It sounds physiocratic, it sounds physical, but it is really about uh, growth. It is the agrarian workers who know best how to increase productivity. That's what it's all about. The increased productivity. So the real productivity is the surplus that we get over time if we compare this year's output to last year's output. And hence we see the political dimension of the term productivity. Only if the right kind of people decide how we use the social product, we will have more next year. Right? If you give it to the, to the wrong people, uh, we will have degrowth. If you give it to the right people, we will have growth. So we have to give the resources to the productive classes because only then we will have a stable growth path, which is necessary in order to have a just society, which, because if we distribute it equally amongst everybody, um, then we will have a just society. So, but in the beginning, you will have uh, to have the most resources to the productive classes, and that's why product productivity as a term is so important. Only if the productive workers have enough elbow room, uh, we can have this bigger cake. If we turn to Adam Smith now, which is a big shift to classical economics, but in the term productivity, it's not really a big shift. It's not so big a shift. It's only small. Um, and how does that work? It's not the agrarian labor itself that's productive in the creative or growth sense, if you have a closer look at the physiocratic uh, regime. In fact, um, it's rather uh, the production, uh, the organization of production, right? You need to organize the production in a way that you have more um, and I'm skipping again because I see that I'm running out of time really. But what Adam Smith does is say that, well, you cannot only do that in a very labor, you can do it everywhere in the economy. So the real thing, that's the miracle behind productivity growth, is not agrarian labor. It's just that they had some smart guys who, who uh, made it happen, right, growth. But you, if you have division of labor in all parts of the economy, you can have growth everywhere. It's not restricted uh, to landlords, right? So that's, uh, that's the big shift, if you want. If it's division of labor that does the job, you can have it everywhere. Uh, division of labor is something that needs to be done permanently. And once you start it, you need to continue doing it. Otherwise, you will be outcompeted. But what is it that you do? The laborer uh, that the capitalist commands does more or less the same all the time. He doesn't increase productivity. Um, 
in industrial or service related fields, uh, we assume that labor is productive in this first sense, like the tree is, always the same, nothing changes. Of course, they produce trees, but uh, you know, it's not productivity growth. Uh, so it needs you, the capitalist, who really does the productive job. Um, how can it be made more productive in the second sense? You divide the labor, and hence you increase, you as a capitalist, you increase the unit output per hour worked. How do you do that? I mean, how does it work? First, you need capital, of course. Um, that is a certain amount of money. And B, you need some machinery to allow to, technically to allow you to, to have this um, division of labor. And for this, C, you need an industry that provides the machinery, of course, you need a technical sector. And D, you need some kind of intellectual labor that makes it possible to uh, have plans and have that on, um, on a permanent basis. So in, in the last run, you also need a university system, something like that, to provide the intellectual manpower to, to drive the system, to have constant growth. Now we need to be precise here, I think, because what exactly means productivity? Um, in the last instance, of course, it's labor somehow that is productive in a certain sense, um, because labor produces the output. Um, however, in the picture of Adam Smith, if productivity means increasing the output, inducing growth, uh, you can also say that capital is productive. Of course, capital is productive. In neoclassical economics, that's a factor of productivity. Right? Productivity is equally shared between all the parts, but somehow, um, and this is what economics, or liberal economics, claimed ever since. And this is also what Ricardian economics uh, denied ever since, because they continue, continue to believe that it's only labor, uh, that that's the job of productivity, because what's the assumption there? I'm really skipping through this. Um, capital is nothing but that labor. So the productivity of capital goes back to the productivity of labor of the period before. So in the last instance, it's always labor. So labor still has the greater claim. Now, I gave you some ideas of classes that are in economic theory. I haven't touched Keynesianism and Neoliberalism yet. Um, maybe I should do that before I wrap up. Um, to wrap up, maybe which way does Keynesianism and Neoliberalism fit into that picture? Um, look back, distinguish again with me three kinds of productivity. First one, reproduction, maybe production of use values on a constant basis. Second, production of surplus value, that is, excess of outputs over inputs in terms of exchange value, that's another second sense. And third, we have this uh, sense of growth or increase in productivity over time. Then, to understand Keynes and uh, the class behind it, claims to productivity in the Keynesian system, I think the third meaning of productivity is the most interesting. Keynes claimed that the system is intrinsically unstable. So you could have growth, you could have profit, but you don't because the system is not stable. So there's no guarantee that the system supplies enough profitability, hence not enough opportunities for investments, hence not enough jobs and income for everybody. So what can you do? Keynes transferred the liberal idea of profitability of money in a smart way towards the government because now it's the government that keeps the economy running, right? You can have deficit spending, you can have all of these uh, Keynesian ideas. The government can be productive in the dynamic understanding by bringing the system back onto its growth path. It's only if I, the government, do something productively, we can have growth. So in the, in the last instance, I'm productive. I'm the government because I fuel the system. The idea of the multiplier, for example, is magic again, right? You invest one million, you get four million out of it. If the savings ratio is one to four, I mean, it's details, but you multiply your investments by this multiplier, and that's productivity written large. Now, what's the monetarist answer to that? Um, one of the criticisms of Keynes from Milton Friedman and these people was exactly going back to this distinction between unproductive and productive labor from this name, that the only thing that the Keynesian can do is produce, uh, invest in unproductive spheres, right? Because otherwise you would crowd out the capitalists and that wouldn't have an impact, so you can only go there. But if you invest into unproductive um, spheres, you will not boost productivity. So Keynesianism is doomed, doomed to fail. The only thing that we can do is direct it uh, into the monetary economy, and then you have monetaries, okay? Um, I was wondering, <laughs> because up to now, you have only classes and theories and then claims that this class should have the most product and the most uh, uh, political, I mean, both economically, the most of the product, but also politically, the most impact on the whole system. 
Now the question would be, what's the Marxist perspective here? And that's where I ended in Ljubljana. <laughs> but I have to end now too because time is over. But just one last thing. I think it's not that there's one more class that has another claim and now wants to have more, right? Laborers. We are the really productive people and so we should have all the resources and we should have a more sane politics. I think this is exactly what Lenin called trade unionist consciousness. That sounds, <laughs> sounds a little bit old fashioned here. Uh, but it seems to be in the logic of what I said. There's always a new class and they have a certain role in society and then they have an economic theory trying to claim that they have the most impact on the economy and hence they should have more power, right? But I think the story of Marxism is different. If you have a look at the details of the theory of productivity in Marx, uh, because all you would get there is exploitation of laborers by laborers because not all labor is productive. Right? And you would have nurses in hospitals, you would have universities, who are not productive in the uh, understanding of productive of social value. They use, they use uh, social wealth. So that means, what about them? They would be exploited by the industrial system, and that doesn't really make sense from a Marxist perspective. So what else do you do? And I think that the basic idea is that you have to decouple income from production. That you have to say, uh, we must stop linking what you earn from what you do in the economy and have a system where we, well, and you know this, right? Uh, Rainer Forst, lately, I mean, I don't agree with most of what he says, almost nothing, but he, uh, he had a lecture, Rainer Forst, uh, an influential political scientist uh, from Germany, um, he lectured on Marx a couple of years ago, and trying to say what actually do we, as critical theory from Frankfurt School, what do we learn from Marx? And what he said is, actually, I can make sense of Marx to a great extent, because I think what's behind this whole story is the theory of political economy, ah, sorry, political autonomy. The solution to this problem that I've focused here um, is not to have another class that has more influence in the economy. No, we as a society have to have a project that allows us to decide on this, not on economic terms, but on political terms. So, it's a kind of, the, the whole Marxian project was some kind of empowerment, uh, bringing the political sphere back into economics and decide on other grounds, not on economic grounds, but on political grounds, how the process, the economic process should be organized. And I think he, he was pretty right in that, that we have to, political economy, um, write political with a big P, right? and that would change the discussion a little bit. That was very rough. Um, but I think I'm pretty much done. But, but maybe I can do some of uh, my role. My mm -hmm. later, maybe I can, uh, the, uh, how we finish now, maybe to be good a little bit deeper that because mm -hmm. I think it's very, very important. So, like, if you talk about uh, societies based on capitalist mode of production, which uh, relies on the liberal concept of uh, productivity, which always means uh, actually the interest of capital for creation of surplus uh, value and maximization of the profit. So productivity in that terms would mean like, uh, let's say, a profit maximization behavior, which almost always means like if we have increasing of productivity, we have increasing of, of exploitation also. So my question and the things which I would like to hear also mm -hmm. from you, like, how would we, would, we, would we define, for example, productivity, category of productivity uh, uh, from socialist perspective, like uh, uh, from societies which are based, uh, which objective is to satisfy the need of the people and to achieve the interest of, of uh, a labor owner. So what kind of category would we, uh, do we need category of, of productivity or, like, or is it needed to be radically transformed in which way? And mm -hmm. I hope you understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a hard question, and I think there are people in the room who have better answers than I do. I think the problem with the notion of productivity as it is now is that it is linked to class, to classes, right? And as long as you have that link, um, for example, um, in socialism itself, I think there was a bias for people, for all the workers who were working in, in productive, let's say, uh, industries. For example, if you produce some kind of good that you can touch, you can take that home 
and then use that on the black market, and then you have an advantage. If you don't have access to that, if you work in another field, uh, that means you, you're a nurse, let's say, right? Okay, you can steal medication, but uh, uh, let's imagine you're a student uh, or a professor. You can, what do you have? You have nothing to, so that means the guys who are in the productive sector here and the, and the unproductive sector here, there's, an, um, there's a problem, and that's, I think, what contributed to, uh, to the economic weakness of uh, socialism in a way, because you didn't uncouple this uh, productivity uh, class nexus, right? In theory, it should be classless society. That would mean um, we have to talk about productivity because we don't want to grow poor. Right? We have to have a productive system that produces enough for everybody. But as long as productivity is monopolized by a certain class, that means that they, they can take from it, right? Like the bankers, I mean, they control the banks. They just take what's in there, right? I have a bonus of two million because I control the, the resources. That's pretty easy. That's all the theory that justifies it. But basically, it's because it's linked uh, in this social classes. So you, the problem, I think, in socialism is that you need productivity in practical terms. But you need to decouple it from political or class uh, power. Do you understand what I mean? So I think and that's a real issue. And I don't have a, I don't have a solution how you could do that. I mean, you, you would have to have a productive sectors, of course. But you would have to have a system that divide from that uh, in a way that is not um, corruptible. So, yes, understand what I mean? And I don't know how how to do that, actually. In the blueprint, I wouldn't know. But. Yes, so.